If you have your Bibles, either a printed copy like I have right here or a digital copy on your phone, let me encourage you to hold it up right now and repeat after me what we believe about this book. This is God's Word. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It is the supreme source of truth for what we believe and how we live. Now, open up your copy of God's Word with me to Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4. I want to start this morning by asking you a question. What are the things you can't stop talking about? What are those things you can't stop talking about? For some of us, it's politics. Every conversation, whether in person or online, seems to make its way to politics. We feed our mind with Fox News or MSNBC or CNN. And because we're feeding our mind with that, then out of our mind flows that through our mouth. And so in every conversation, we're talking politics. For others of us, it's sports. It may be football since today is Super Bowl Sunday or it could be basketball or it could be baseball, but but we know sports. We follow sports. And man, we know the stats on our teams and on our players and we love to get together with other people and just talk sports. And then for others of us, It's either our kids or our grandkids. Every time we get together with someone, we we click on our phone and we show the pictures of our kids' latest exploits or accomplishments because we just love our kids and we're going to always talk about our kids in our conversations. Now, I want you to listen to me. There's nothing wrong with talking about politics. We live in a political country. And to be honest with you, those of us who are followers of Christ should be involved in the political process. And there's nothing wrong with talking sports and enjoying sports. Sports is a a great form of recreation and we should be able to enjoy that. And, And there's certainly nothing wrong with talking about your family, your kids and your grandkids. You should be proud of them. But I want you to know those are not the things that we should not be able to stop talking about. The Bible makes it clear that there's only one thing that we shouldn't be able to stop talking about, and that's the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus loves us and wants to save us. Now, today we're wrapping up a series on six habits that can change your life. And the reason we've called them that is because we believe that if you will really initiate these habits and make these things habits in your life, they're not only going to change you temporarily, they are going to change you eternally. We've talked about prayer, talking to God. We've talked about reading, spending time in God's Word. We've talked about managing our time, using our time wisely. We've talked about stewarding the resources that God has put in our care for his um, um, glory and used to build up his kingdom. Last week, we talked about gathering together regularly with other believers. But today, as we wrap up this series, I want us to talk about sharing our faith, something that Jesus commanded us to do before he returned to heaven. It's something that every disciple, every follower of Jesus is not only expected to do, is not only something we ought to do, but it's something that Jesus commanded us to do. Then in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John had just healed a man who had been lame from birth. And after that miracle, a crowd gathered in the temple courts. There were thousands of people there. And as the people gathered in the temple courts, Peter and John began to preach to them about Jesus. And that's where our story begins in Acts chapter 4, verse 1. Notice what it says. It says, while, they were, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus There is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and and since it was already evening, put them in jail until the morning. 
But many of the people who heard the message believed it. And so the number of believers now totaled about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Now don't miss that. Because Peter and John were faithful in sharing the gospel. The number of believers, not including women and children, had grown to over 5,000 people. That means that most likely there were 12 to 13 to 14,000 believers or more at this time in Jerusalem. In a matter of weeks, no more than months, thousands of people had become followers of Jesus. They had grown from a group of 120 to over thousands strong. Now, why did that happen? It happened because Peter and John and the other disciples were sharing the gospel. Now, here's what I know. The more we share the gospel, the more people we will see believe the gospel. That's just a fact of life. The more we share, the more we will see believe. Now, listen to what it says next. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders, elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there along with Caiaphas, John Alexander, and, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men. No special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that, that they have performed a miraculous sign. And everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. And Peter and John were thrown in jail. They were threatened and they were commanded to never speak again about Jesus. But instead of giving in and giving up, they doubled down. They said, we cannot stop telling everything that we have seen and heard. Nothing could shut them up. There's a passage in the Old Testament that's, that's very similar. Jeremiah was a prophet of God who always proclaimed God's word to people who didn't want to hear it. And he was thrown in a cistern, a well. He was put in prison. I mean, he, he had many things happen to him. Tradition tells us that later on in life, he was stoned to death in Egypt by the Jews that he was trying to proclaim the good news of God to. Well, there was a point in Jeremiah's life where he said, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to talk about the Lord anymore. Enough is enough. I'm sharing and nothing's happening. And so he decided, I'm going to quit talking about the Lord. But listen to what it says in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. It says, but I, if I say, I will never mention the Lord or speak his name, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I'm worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. What Jeremiah was saying is I tried not to talk about the Lord. But whenever I tried not to talk about the Lord, it was like a fire burning deep inside of me, burning my bones. I could not hold it in. I want you to listen to me. 
If we are going to be used to change our world, we're going to have to be like Peter and John and Jeremiah. We need to be so filled with God's Spirit that we can't keep quiet wherever we are. In the gym, at school, in our neighborhoods, at work, at the grocery store. We need to ask God to so fill us with the gospel that we can't keep quiet. And our nation desperately needs the gospel more than it ever has. New data shows that the United States is the largest English-speaking mission field in the world. Did you get that? The United States is the largest English-speaking mission field in the world. The country that says one nation under God, the country that has on its currency and God we trust, we are the largest English-speaking mission field in the world. We are only behind India and China as far as number of lost people in the world. Let that sink in. There are only two nations with more lost people in them than America, India and China. If ever you and I as the people of God needed to begin sharing our faith powerfully, it is today. Sharing our faith needs to be a habit that we can't stop. So how? How can we make it a habit to share our faith and change our world? Well, I believe there are five things that we see in this chapter that you and I need if we're going to make it a habit of sharing our faith. Here's the first thing. We need to know Jesus personally. I want you to notice what what the religious leader said about Peter and John in verse 13. It says they realized that these men had been with Jesus. Jesus had changed their lives. I'm afraid that that one of the primary problems in our churches today is that many of us have never had a life-changing experience with Jesus. We've heard about him. We know about him. We can quote stories about him. But if we're honest, we cannot say that Jesus has changed our lives. We know stories about Jesus, but we don't have a story about Jesus. We can explain the truths about Jesus, but Jesus has never personally touched our life. Look at me. Has Jesus changed your life? Are you different today because of Jesus? Are you different because he has saved you from sin and death? Later on, when when Peter was writing to the church, he said in his first epistle, 1 Peter, he said, but you are the ones chosen by God to do his work and speak out for him. And then he said this, he said, to tell others the night and day difference that he has made in your life. Listen, has Jesus made a night and day difference in your life? If he's come into your life, he has. It doesn't matter when you got saved, what age you were, how deep into sin you were. If Jesus is living in you, he has made a night and day difference in your life. When we come face to face with our sinfulness and and God's holiness and realize that it is only through God's grace that we can be saved and we experience that grace firsthand, it changes everything. Mark Batterson, who is a pastor of a church in Washington, D.C., said this. He said, the cross is God's way of saying you're worth dying for. And then he said this. He said, when that truth penetrates your heart, when that truth that God said you're worth dying for, when that truth penetrates your heart, it will transform how you think, how you feel, and how you live. We will look at Jesus differently. We will look at ourselves differently. We will look at everyone else differently in light of personally experiencing God's grace. 
We will see Jesus as our sovereign Lord and King, the ruler of heaven and earth. We will realize that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And we will want to live our life as if he is the Lord of our life. We will see ourselves as redeemed sinners who are not only saved from the penalty of sin, but praise God, redeemed sinners who through the power of the Holy Spirit are being saved from the power of sin. We will see other people just like ourselves as sinners in need of God's grace and God's mercy and God's love and God's forgiveness. Let me encourage you to take a moment and look back at your life and ask yourself, when did Jesus change my life? Because if you're saved, he has. When the indwelling Spirit of God, and that's what happens when we're saved, God's Spirit comes to live in us. When the indwelling Spirit of God comes to live in us, the Bible describes it as being born again. It's like a birth experience. Everything changes. My wife, she was saved at six years old. She hadn't done a lot of bad stuff at six years old. There's not a lot of bad stuff for six-year-olds to do. But she knew she was lost. She knew that she needed a Savior. And as a six-year-old, she humbly asked Jesus to forgive her and save her. And Jesus changed her life. He kept her from, from a lot of the sin and the junk and the nastiness of this world. He changed her life life. It doesn't matter whether you're saved as a young kid or you're saved as a teenager or you're saved as a young adult or you're saved as a senior adult. When Jesus saves you, he changes everything. So look at me. This is important. This is your eternal destiny at stake. Has Jesus changed your life? Here's the second thing. We have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice what it says about Peter in verse 8. It says, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's important for you to remember that, that all of the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit filled them all. In, in verse 8, right here, we are told again that Peter was filled anew with the Holy Spirit. In verse 31, we're told that all the believers that gathered together at that moment praying were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we're filled with the Holy Spirit when we're saved, and yet throughout Scripture, we're told of believers being filled with the Spirit again. Now, why? If we're filled with the Spirit when we're saved, why do we need to be filled with the Spirit again? Can I tell you why? Because we leak. We leak. We're filled with the Spirit, and all of a sudden, we find ourselves no longer filled with the Spirit. Now, how do I know that? Because in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul commands us, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. He commands us to be filled with the Spirit. Why? Because all too often, we're not filled with the Spirit. Now, how do we know if we're filled with the Spirit? Well, in Acts chapter 1, it says that, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we will be witnesses of Jesus in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We're a witness for Jesus. In verse 8 of chapter 4, when, when Peter was filled with the Spirit, he spoke the Word of God boldly. In, in verse 31 of chapter 4, when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke the Word of God boldly. Now listen to me. I'm not the best of Bible scholars but I believe it's pretty clear that the evidence that we are filled with the Holy Spirit is not some, some expression of worship. It's not experiencing some spiritual gift. And it's not even a certain degree of holiness. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, the evidence is we will boldly proclaim God's Word. Whenever people were filled with the Spirit of God in the Bible, they began to boldly proclaim that Jesus saves. Now, why? Why, when we're filled with the Spirit, do we do that? Because when you're filled with something, it begins to pour out of you. And if we're filled with the Spirit, the Spirit 
will pour out of us. And when the Spirit comes, he convicts the world of sin, the need for righteousness, and the judgment to come. He points to Jesus. Understand, that's what the Spirit does. And so if we are filled with the Spirit, we're going to be telling people about Jesus. So let me ask you, are you filled with the Spirit? You can say, oh, yes, I've had this experience. Whoopie-doo. That doesn't mean a thing. The evidence that we're filled is that we're going to boldly proclaim that Jesus saves. Here's the third thing. We've got to turn our conversations to Jesus. Notice what Peter said in verse 12. He said there is salvation in no one else. And let me just set that up for you. The religious leader said, by whose authority, by whose name are, are you doing these things? Peter said, thank you so much for setting this up for me. And he went straight to Jesus. You see, if we're going to ever see our world saved, we're going to have to take Jesus outside of the doors of our church and onto the streets. Being on fire for Jesus is not about how many times during the week you come to church, but how often you open your mouth during the week and tell lost people about Jesus. Your classmates, your co-workers, your neighbors, your peers. Our problem isn't that we cannot but proclaim what we've seen and heard. Our problem is we hardly ever proclaim what we've seen and heard. There's an old saying that's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi that says, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. That's wrong. That's wrong. The gospel must be proclaimed with words the apostle paul said this is the gospel christ died for our sins he rose from the grave and he was buried on the third day and he rose from the grave for our sins that's the gospel the gospel is that we have to turn from our sin trust in jesus and surrender our life to him as lord that's the gospel and that has to be proclaimed the bible says how will they hear unless someone tells them So how do we do that? How do we turn our conversations to Jesus? Well, we build bridges. And that's easy to do in our world because our world is turned upside down. I mean, today, would you agree that a lot of people are living in fear? So much uncertainty? I mean, so you can say, man, I used to live that way, but but I met Jesus and, and man... He's taken all my fear away. He told me to cast my cares, my fears on him because he cares for me. This past week, we shot down a Chinese balloon that was spying on us. In the last couple of days, we've shot down two other, evidently, balloons off the coast of um, um, Alaska and in, and in um, Canada. And then something was found over Montana yesterday. I mean, we live in a, a, a time of uncertainty like We haven't in a long, long time. All of this uncertainty in our world can can bring us to conversations where we can point to Jesus who gives us hope that is outside this world. I'm so thankful. I mean, my wife last night, we were watching the news and was talking about, you know, what was going on in Montana. And she said, are you worried? Are you concerned? And I said, no, I'm not concerned. Is it troubling that we're finding all of these things flying over our airspace now? That's troubling. But I'm not worried because, to be honest with you, I know Jesus is coming back soon. And if he chooses to take me out some other way before he comes back, I'm just in his presence a lot quicker. Amen? I mean, if you have Jesus, listen to me. If you have Jesus, then I'm telling you... To to die is gain. We don't live for this world. We live for something else. And so we take every conversation back to Jesus. Fourth, be full of grace, but be filled with courage. Verse 20 again says, we cannot stop telling about everything we've seen and heard. Verse 13, the religious leaders, it says that they beheld the boldness of, of Peter and John. Peter and John shared the gospel with these these religious men. They didn't hold anything back, and yet they shared 
with grace and respect. Later on, as Paul was writing his epistle to the church, he said this in 1 Peter chapter 3. He said, if anyone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it, but do this with a gentle and respectful spirit. We don't talk down to people. We don't look down to people. We aren't condescending with people. We're respectful as we share Jesus. The grace of God should always lead us to be kind and respectful as we share the gospel. And then finally, breathe our efforts in prayer. In chapter 4, verse 24, Peter and John were let go. And when they went back to the church, it says, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer. Nothing that truly lasts will happen apart from prayer. Now, if you continue to read this chapter, you will discover that the church had a prayer meeting after Peter and John got back. And you ought to read that prayer in Acts chapter 4 because it's an amazing prayer. But then in verse 29, we see the end of that prayer. And in verse 31, we see the answer to that prayer. I want you to listen to what it says. In verse 29, it says, And now, O Lord, hear their threats. Give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. After this prayer, the meeting place shook. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Did you get that? They were threatened with their lives if they continued to tell people about Jesus. And they didn't pray, Lord, take the persecution away. Now, I don't doubt if they prayed that at other times. I would pray that. Lord, Lord, take this persecution away. That's, I think, a common sense prayer. But that's not what they prayed here. They prayed, Lord, give us boldness in the midst of the persecution. And what did God do? God filled them with the Holy Spirit. And it says in verse 31, they proclaim the word of God with boldness. And notice this wasn't a, a movement just of the apostles or a chosen few. Everyone was filled with the Spirit. They were all filled with the Spirit. And they all spoke the word of God boldly. If we're going to ever change our world, it's going to take each and every one of us boldly sharing the good news that Jesus saves. In Wilmore, Kentucky, there's a small Christian university called Ashbury University. And today, right now, uh, there seems to be a genuine revival breaking out there. I mean, a God thing. Not a series of services. No, they were having chapel service this past week and God showed up and, and it hasn't stopped. But what you need to know is that at that same time, small Christian university back in the 1970s a revival broke out and that revival at that small Christian university in Ashbury spread across the United States and became known as the Jesus movement you can look it up but it was a movement where God just moved among college students and hundreds and thousands of of college students came to faith in Jesus. And it literally changed hundreds of thousands and probably millions of lives during that period of time. And I got to say, Lord, do it again. Lord, may your spirit fall upon us in such a way that hundreds and thousands of people will be ushered into your family. So what can we do? Well, let me give you five simple steps that everybody can do, and then we're going to close it out. First, live an authentic Christian life. That's simple. Live an authentic Christian life. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says you should live in a way that proves you belong to the God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. You know the problem with some of us? Listen, you're not living any different than your lost neighbors. Not any different. You're talking the same, acting the same, doing the exact same things. They don't see any difference in your life. The Bible says that we are to live authentic Christian life. Someone once said this, the number one proof that God is real is a changed life. Live an authentic Christian life. Second, pray for the lost by name. Today, start a prayer list. If you don't already have one, of people who are lost who need Jesus. Every day, I pray for family members. 
I pray for friends and neighbors. I pray for the children of friends of mine that need Jesus in their life. I pray that the Holy Spirit will convict them of sin, their need for righteousness, and that the judgment is coming. I pray that God would open up their eyes, their, their minds, and their hearts to the reality that God is real and Jesus is real. And I pray that they will be miserable in their sin and realize this sin in this world will never give them what they're looking for. Every day, I pray for them. Nothing is going to change until you make a commitment to pray for the lost. Third, invite your unchurched friends to church. In 1 John chapter 1, it says, Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. It doesn't matter who you are. You can bring your unchurched friends to Jesus. Today in our services, not in children's and preschool, but today in our services, we'll have over 1,000 people in our three services here. Now, I know I'm not foolish enough to believe that everybody at 8, 9, 30, and 11 are going to go out and start going door to door talking about Jesus. I know that's not going to happen. But here's what I do know. Anybody whose life can be changed, has been changed by Jesus, can invite somebody to church that doesn't know Jesus. I mean, anybody can do that. I mean, that's not really hard. You don't have to learn anything. You just got to say, hey, come to church with me and let's go out to eat afterwards. Do you know what statistics reveal? Statistics reveal that the overwhelming majority of unchurched people will attend church if they're invited by a friend. Did you hear that? The overwhelming majority majority of unchurched people will attend church if they're invited by a friend but you know what the statistics went on to say the overwhelming majority of people that go to church never invite anyone to church let me ask you don't raise your hand but when was the last time if you've known jesus since your life has been changed by jesus when was the last time you invited anybody to church when was the last time Think what would happen if just this year we would just have a, a movement of inviting people to church. What if we said, let's partner together? We will provide a worship service where the music will draw people's hearts to Jesus and we'll open up God's Word and try to correctly divide the Word of truth so that God's Spirit can work in people's lives. All you have to do is invite them. What if we just did that? We partnered together in that way. And after they come, you just take them to dinner and say, hey, how'd you like it? If they say, you hated it, they hated it, you could say, well, I didn't think the preacher was that good today either. <laughs> I mean, or, or you could say, what is it you hated? You can, you can start a conversation with them. I mean, that's where change happens. Change starts with conversations, amen? So we invite people. The third thing that we need to do, or the fourth thing, is tell our story. Every Christian has a story. And though everybody's story is different, everybody's story is the same. Every Christian has a story of their life before Jesus, how they came to know Jesus, and how Jesus has changed their life. Everybody. You say, well, I don't know my life before Jesus. Well, if you don't know your life before Jesus, you need to see whether you really know Jesus. Because the Bible says that apart from Jesus, we're all lost and headed to hell. And the Bible says no one is righteous, no one is good. Everybody has to come to a place where they understand their lostness before they can be saved. So our story is my life before Jesus, how I came to know Jesus, and how Jesus has changed my life. Tell your story to people. And then finally, tell the gospel. The gospel is God's story. Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried. He raised it, was raised again on the third day according to Scripture for our sins. That's the gospel. So what do we have to do? We have to turn from our sin. We have to trust Jesus and surrender our life to him. That's the gospel. That's simple. If you start selling that to enough people, you're going to see people say, I need Jesus. Here's what I know. We're not going to ever see God change our community, change our country, change our world until those of us who have been changed begin to share the good news. I read a story this past week, a true story that was riveting. It's about a man named Bill. Bill was a giant of a man, very violent man. He was a drug addict, an alcoholic, a drug dealer, dealing PCP. 
And one day, someone came up to him, had the audacity to come up to him on a street corner and give him a gospel track. He didn't throw it away. He kept it, and he said that night, didn't know why, but he began to look through that gospel track, and that night in his hotel room, Bill repented of his sins and gave his life to Jesus. Jesus radically changed Bill's life to the point that he wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. And listen, a gospel track used by the Holy Spirit can change a person's life. He gave his life to Jesus. He wanted everybody else to know about Jesus. One day, he was telling in his story that, that he was in a restaurant with a friend. He told his friend to clear off the table and, and Bill, this giant of a man, got on the top of the table in this restaurant and started yelling, emergency, emergency. Everybody got quiet and looked at him and said, it's an emergency if you don't know Jesus because you're going to hell. You need Jesus. Now, I'm not telling you that's the way you need to witness. I'm not sure that that's the most effective way to do it, but you can't, you can't judge bill because at least bill wanted people to know jesus well bill got married he had a little girl and he began to go around telling people about jesus and lives were being changed well his little girl began to see her daddy's love for jesus and how jesus had changed his life and, and one day she gave his life her life to jesus when she was about six years old and she told her daddy i want to share the gospel with you and so Bill began to take his little six-year-old daughter with them, and they devised this way that they were going to share. Now imagine Bill, this six-foot-six man and this little tiny six-year-old girl, and he said that he would put her on his shoulders, and he said the place they loved most were elevators. They would get on a crowded elevator, and they would start the elevator up, and the little girl would say to her daddy, Daddy, should I tell them or do you want to tell them? And he would look up at his daughter, and he would say, I don't know. Do you want to tell them or do you want me to tell them? And they would go back and forth like that until someone would finally say, just tell us. <laughs> and the little girl said, my daddy used to do dope deals, but now he do, does hope deals because Jesus changed his life. And through those simple words, hundreds of people came to faith in Jesus. It doesn't take a, a lot to stir somebody's heart for their need for Jesus. Well, that little six-year-old girl became sick developed a incurable disease she ended up in the hospital on her deathbed and while she was there she looked at her mommy and daddy and she said mommy daddy i hate the devil because he's done this to me and then she said these words she said by his stripes i am healed and she closed her eyes and she died the doctors came in tried to work on her but she was gone and understand that verse isn't about physical healing. That verse is about spiritual healing. By his stripes we are healed. And she went into the presence of Jesus healed forever. His wife left the room. They took her body out and he was still sitting there. And after a while he realized that he never was able to say goodbye to his little girl. He went out of the room. He asked them where her body would be and he found out it was in the temporary morgue in the basement of the hospital until the funeral home came to get it. And he went down there. And there was a nurse down there. And he said, my daughter just died. And I wasn't able to say goodbye. Can I go in and, and see her one last time? And the nurse shrugged her shoulders and said, sure. He went in. He found her body. He picked up her little tiny body in his arms and he began to hug it. He said, baby, daddy loves you. Jesus loves you. Tell Jesus for me that I love him, and I'll see you soon. All of a sudden, he heard this, this just moaning, crying behind him, and he turned around, and it was the nurse who had entered the room. And almost ho hollering, she said, How? How can you talk to God that way? Most parents that come in here are angry with God for taking their kids, but, but you're saying that you're looking forward to seeing him soon. How? Bill looked down at the corpse of his little girl, and he said, do you want to tell her, or should I tell her? And then he said, because you're with Jesus, I'll tell her. 
And he turned. And he said, the Bible says that we who know Jesus don't grieve like those who have no hope. You see, I have hope. I know that my daughter is with Jesus. And I know that because I know Jesus, one day I'm going to be with Jesus and my daughter forever. Do you know Jesus? And right there in that temporary morgue, that nurse gave her life to Jesus. Now listen to me. Listen to me. I'm not telling you that story to get some tears from your eyes. It's not the purpose of it. What I want you to see that if a little girl who is six years old could talk about Jesus up till the time of her death, and her daddy could point people to Jesus even as he was sitting there with her corpse, then what excuse do we have? When our son passed away in 2017, suddenly, no time to prepare. The only thing I ask is, God, somehow, some way, let me use this to tell people about your love and your mercy and your grace. Because that's what it's all about. There's two things I want you to hear this morning. First of all, if you don't know Jesus personally, you need to. If Jesus hasn't changed your life, you're not going to heaven. It doesn't matter how good you may think you are. It doesn't matter how often you come to church. If Jesus hasn't changed your life, you're not going to heaven. And you desperately need to humble yourself before Jesus and ask him to change your life, to trust him to be your Savior. And in just a moment... We're going to stand and we're going to sing. And I'm going to ask you, if you're here and you don't know, to muster the courage to come forward, take Pastor Scott or myself by the hand and say, I need Jesus. Let us tell you what's next. But then second, if you're here and you know Jesus, you know that you've been saved, then I'm going to ask you to come down to this, this kneeling bench and just kneel down before everybody else and ask Jesus to give you the courage in 2023 to begin to share your faith in a way that's pleasing and honoring to him. You say, why do I need to come down to do that? Because I want you to listen. If you're not willing to come forward among peers and make a commitment to pray, to ask God to give you courage to be a witness, then there's no way you're going to be a witness out there in a hostile world. God will use your courage to come and pray to give you courage out there in the world. I want you to stand with me right now, and I'm going to pray. Our altar time is going to begin. And I just simply ask you to be obedient to how God's touching your heart. Father God Almighty, this is your time. And I simply ask that you'll have your way. Lord, I pray that no one will leave here today that does not know you. Lord, draw them down this aisle overwhelm them with your mercy and your grace and your love and your desire to transform them please Lord God for those of us who know you burden our hearts for those who are still far from you Lord I pray that today we'll make commitments to do our part proclaiming to the world that your son Jesus saves. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing.